You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Survivor 46 is here and so is On Fire, the only official Survivor podcast. And we have a twist this season. The winner of Survivor 45, D. Vyadaris, will be joining us every week. We're going behind the scenes of the biggest moments, the how and the why things happen, and the strategy and analysis you can only get from someone like me, a Survivor winner. Listen to On Fire, the official Survivor podcast, wherever you get your podcast. Does Monday at the office feel like a storm? Not with Microsoft Copilot. That feeling when Copilot gets everyone up to speed instantly? It's sunny again. When Copilot simplifies complex data so your teams can act, that sun's shining on a beach. And when Copilot uncovers hidden insights, you're on that beach with your people and you find buried treasure. That's Microsoft Copilot. Learn more at Microsoft.com slash AI for all. All right, what's up, guys? Welcome to Packers Total Access. My name is Clayton. You can check us out on Packernet.com. You can find me on Twitter at Packers underscore access. If you'd like to email the show, you can send a message to Packers Total Access at gmail.com. Been getting a lot of great emails here lately, so keep them coming, guys. We're actually going to answer a couple of those this evening, and we've got a power pack show. I mean, we've got a ton of stuff to get to, so many different topics being tossed around on social media and just – throughout the uh, the entire, you know, uh, Packer fan base and um, a lot of, you know, great insight, a lot of great opinions, a lot of differing opinions. And I always love it when when you can have a conversation with people and it not turn into an argument and you come away maybe even disagreeing, right? I think that's always a healthy thing. I think it's it's great for the fan base. I know this, man, me personally – I've learned way more from people that I disagree with than people that I agree with. And, and, you know, in today's society, everything's this big echo chamber. It's let me, let me get hooked up with a group of people that agree with everything I agree with. And let's just sit around and talk about the stuff that bothers us. Right. It's essentially what happens. I try to stay away from that. Although I fall victim to it from time to time too. And you're kind of seeing that with the Packer fan base, um, especially this year with it being a down year. And um, I want to say this, man, I've, I've met a lot of great people this year and 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 had some great conversations. Even though it's a down year, we're talking about the future. We're talking about what's going on right now and how, you know, the Packers could potentially turn it around. It's looking more and more, you know, uh, meek, I guess you could say, as the season goes along. But um, always holding out hope until they say you've officially been eliminated, right? I remember the year when when there was a game going on at Lambeau and, and the Minnesota Vikings – um, we're playing, I believe, in Arizona, and Arizona threw a Hail Mary at the end of the game or a last-second shot play and scored on Minnesota. And because that touchdown happened with no time left, Lambeau erupted because it meant the Packers squeaked into the playoffs. You know, some of those are, are, are the best years. And, I, you know, we get so used to winning 12 and 13 games a year and having the top five offense and all these different things that sometimes you forget about those times where – you know, the Packers might not have been as dominant, at least in a regular season, and, uh, and you know, just found a way to put it together. And, and some, of those, some of those memories are my fondest, I guess is what I'm trying to say. But I do want to say that tonight's show, today's show rather, is brought to you by um, Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry, or FGR. It was birthed out of the burden to help those in our community and congregations who've come out of a difficult past or an addictive lifestyle. You guys know that hits home, home with me there. Um, with some of my family members and and some of my past and people dealing with addiction, especially and uh, and a rough upbringing, so love what they're doing there. We are doing a giveaway. We're giving away a a, a white away Beckett style Quay Walker jersey that's been autographed, got the certificate of authenticity from uh, pristineauction.com. We're giving that away. Um, we're going to do a drawing. So if you want to enter that contest, just go to my Twitter page. There'll be a tweet that's pinned at the top of the page. Uh, again, my Twitter account is at Packers underscore access. The tweet that's pinned at the top of the page, you just retweet that tweet. Make sure you're following the account. That'll enter you in the contest one time. And then if you want to support a great cause and also get yourself entered into that contest multiple times, you can go to Fertile Ground Ranch Discipleship Ministry. There's a 
a uh, tweet that's attached to that same tweet that's pinned. Um, you can click on that and donate. Uh, for every $5 you donate to that cause, that enters you into the contest one additional time, and there's no limit to how many times you can donate and enter into that contest. I know we have multiple people doing that. So with that being said, let's get into the show. Let's hop into some emails real quick. Um, first comes from uh, Nicholas McSwain, and he said, I hate, take, I hate talking on the phone, so I'm resorting to email. Um, looks like Packers are going to miss out on this one too, but honestly, not super upset about it. He was watching the Bills game live. Evidently, the game was wrapping up when he sent this email in. I was expecting a blowout, but the Packers have stuck in the whole game. This is the most complete we've seen the team play all year. I would completely agree with that. What the heck was Quay thinking? Absolutely unacceptable in my opinion. Might get backlash for saying this, but I think he should be benched for at least a game. He really hurt the team by pushing a freaking coach. Biggest takeaway for me, though, is the offense looked alive. I can't believe how much heart they put into this game. You can really see they're giving it their all. I wonder how different this game would be if Watson or Watkins um, didn't get injured in the first quarter. Anywho, overall disappointed in the loss, but just the fact that they stuck with it uh, so long and how the offense played, uh, I'm more hopeful for the rest of the season. Thanks for the awesome podcast. Y'all show are my favorite. Well, thank you so much for the uh, kind words there, Nicholas, and um, you hit on a bunch of things, man. Let's go to the Quay thing. I've heard a lot of different opinions about Quay Walker getting ejected from that game. I've heard some people say it was the coach's fault. I've heard the majority of people say it was Quay's fault. I've heard some people say it wouldn't have happened if Matt LaFleur was a leader. I don't know how that comes into play. I've heard other people say, no, it's 100% on the players to, to lead themselves. All these different opinions. First things first, the coach initiated contact with him first, right? now. Like they say, you're always you're always gonna the second person is always gonna get caught. Somebody comes up and cuffs you in the back of the head, teacher doesn't see it, they're gonna see it when you come around with that right cross and put them on the keister, right? And you're gonna get in trouble. That's the way it's always been. Trust me, I have past experience <laughs> every single time. That's how it happens, right? With that being said, I think something should be done to the coach too. And some some people were saying, Well, I kind of felt like he was trying to catch him. I didn't see it that way at all. He was looking past Quay and kind of grabbed Quay's shoulder pad and kind of just gave him a little nudge, like almost like, hey, get out of the way, let me celebrate with my guy. And Quay's like, dude, get your hands off of me. What are you doing, right? I think it's always going to be an issue as long as the sidelines are that close and, and players and coaches are allowed to do what they want to do. You've noticed that in the past, um, in some cases, it's the no-fun league. They're not allowed to jaw with each other. They'll get a penalty. They're not allowed to celebrate. They'll get a penalty, all these things. And we go through these cycles constantly where they'll over-officiate or penalize people for something that's totally stupid. And then in other cases, you'll actually see them um, not get penalized for things that it's like, whoa, that's a little bit over the, over the top there, right? So with the Quay Walker thing, it's on Quay, first of all. The fact that some people were trying to say this is Matt LaFleur's fault is just absolutely silly. At some point, we've got to put accountability on the players. Like, So what I've learned this week is Darnell Savage not being able to make a tackle is Joe Barry's fault. Quay Walker losing his cool on a sideline because a coach touched him or a player or a fish, whatever it was, team, team member over there touched him, that's Matt LaFleur's fault. Aaron Rodgers... Um, not getting rid of the ball quick enough because the receivers are A, either running the wrong route concepts or B, the offensive line is in his face. That's uh, That falls on uh, Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur. Okay, nothing to do with the offensive line, nothing to do with the receivers. It's those two guys, okay? This stuff doesn't make any sense to me. Jair Alexander getting eat alive by McLaurin two weeks ago. That was Joe Barry's fault. Man coverage. Keep in mind, man coverage. Joe Barry said, go cover that guy and don't let him catch the ball. He's your man. He failed, and it's Joe Barry's fault. When three weeks ago, people were saying, we need to play more man coverage, and why ain't Jair following the number one receiver? You know, Ryan hit on it on the pod, too. Last week, it seems like they put Rasul on digs, a little bit over the top help. That's kind of what I came away with. There's other people might have differing opinions. I'm not here to argue about it, but – Rasul got beat, and and Ryan's kind of like, well, we tried that. Now we deviated away from what we were doing. Now we're coming back to what we were doing, this and that. The one thing I will fault this coaching staff for is I think they're listening to the outside, and they need to turn off the sports talk radio. They need to lock the freaking doors. They need to pull their team leaders in and go, listen, 
we're doing what we think is right. We're doing what we worked on all year. And if and you're like Mike Holmgren told Brett Favre way back in the day, and I know Brett Favre is a hot, hot button topic right now. And I, I'm strictly talking about football. I'm not talking about anything off the field, whether he's innocent, guilty, whatever y'all want to do, hang him at the gallows, do your thing. Okay. I'm talking about football. This podcast is about football. I remember him saying, you know, wherever we go, this is Holmgren talking to Favre. We're going to get there together. We might end up in the in the ditch dead, but we'll be there together, right? That's the mindset you've got to have for a team. And right now it just doesn't feel like they have that. Now, does that fall on the coaching staff? It's possible. But, again, I look for players to lead. To me, the coaching staff's job is to organize practice reps, to make sure they're putting their they get this collective roster from the general manager and say, okay, what does each player do really, really well? Let's put them in the best position possible to succeed based on our game plan, what we think works, the way we want to attack the game of football. Now, if, if there's another thing that I would fault the coaching staff with, it's the fact that they are um they're kind of hesitant to evolve. And when they do evolve, when they do adapt, when they do adjust, it seems to be a bit extreme. That's just me personally. I like Joe Barry's Nick Fangio style defense. Why? Because I am the most boring redneck you'll ever meet in your life. I'm the person that's under promise over deliver. I'm that guy that says, don't get your hopes up, right? I'm not saying it's the, the happiest way to live your life, but me, it's expect the worst and hope for the best. And if you plan for the worst, then nothing catches you off freaking guard. I love that about the Fangio style defense. It wasn't overly aggressive. You keep everything in front of you. You make them use the entire field, make them make the mistakes. You've seen it all year last year. Remember the Russell Douglas interceptions? All those big plays. You, you know, it's it's you show that too high look. You're showing deep. You're gonna make them check down everything, check down everything. Eventually they'll make a mistake. That style defense, it's been thrown out the window now. And I think it's because they're listening to outside. You know, so there are some sources that come forward and said the players are upset with the uh, with the defensive style play calling. You know what I would say if I was Joe Barry? First of all, I'd go to the head coach. I'd pull Brian Gutekinds together. I'd pull Matt LaFleur together. I'd get Mark Murphy. We'd sit in a freaking room, close the door, and i go, listen, I'm the defensive coordinator. If you want me gone, you say it right now. Fire my butt. Run me out of here right now. You tell me when to leave, and I'll leave. But until you say that, I'm going back in there. And I'm going to let every single freaking player in that locker room know that I'm the leader of this defense and we're going to do what I say we're going to do. And if you don't like it, there's the door. Sorry if that's too rough. That's Vince Lombardi 101. That's all the great defensive coaches. You know, th think of Rex Ryan when he was there in, in Baltimore, right? When he was helping, you know, bring up that Baltimore defense before he got the job there with the New York Jets. Think of the great, you know, think of his dad, Buddy Ryan. Could you imagine? I want you to think for a second. Buddy Ryan, the same guy that used to call uh, Hall of Famer Mike Singletary fat so. Could you imagine if one of those players came in the locker room and said, well, I just don't like the play calling style. Are you serious? So in that sense, I think Joe Barry is a little bit at fault because he's not being aggressive enough towards these players. They're ba they babied them. I mean, you see the DB group run around, and sure enough, Buffalo right out of the gate. And I know some people are saying, well, Stephon Diggs stirred that up. If you watch the tape and you watch the entire film, they share a tunnel, which is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my life. I mean, I love Buffalo. Don't get me wrong. I love the fans. I love everything about that small community with a with an awesome football program. But the fact that the, the teams have to come out of the same tunnel, that's like 1983 stuff. I don't understand it. But they're having to come out of the same tunnel. And, and everybody said, well, Diggs was waiting on him. The whole team was kind of there. It, it, let's say Diggs does say something to him. Keep your mouth shut and handle business, Jire. And he did. He went on the field and handled his business. He did. But I don't like that jaw. Talk's cheap, man. I, that's just the way I feel about it. I would be the guy that would turn my head and just go, I don't hear you. I don't hear you. And the first chance I get, I'd peel his cap. I, I That would be worth the 15-yard penalty to me to send a, to send a freaking message, not shoving a coach on the sideline. But anyway, that's kind of how I feel about that. Um, didn't mean to go on that rant, but just wanted to answer this email. Really appreciate it, Nicholas. That's good stuff, man. And like I said, thank you for supporting the pod. Um, I agree. Quay's got to Quay's got to keep his cool there on the sideline. It does no good. If you're going to get a penalty, get a penalty for laying somebody out and sending a message on the field. Um, not that you're saying that, but that's just the like I said, the redneck in me. This is the same guy that got thrown out of a high school baseball game because I 
I slid into second and threw dirt into the shortstop's eyes. I just – I'm not a fair gamesmanship kind of guy. I go zero to 100 in just a couple seconds. But on to the next email. Chris Nichols says – and Chris Nichols sent uh, several emails. I, I had to narrow it down to one, and I like this one. It kind of caught my attention. It, it's on a topic I'm somewhat familiar with. But Chris Nichols says, <clears throat> what do the Packers need to do to solve the salvage, the savage, I'm sorry, savage situation? Talking about Darnell Savage. It's crazy to me that he earned a fifth-year option. Sunk cost, I guess. Do we pursue someone in free agency or two players with Amos contract expiring, draft multiple safeties, or stick with him? The later would be crazy to me. It's such an important position. Trading up for Savage and then doubling down with the option shows me a real issue with Goot showing way too much blind faith. Cut your losses, tear off the Band-Aid. This kind of goes hand in hand, excuse me, with the uh, with some of the conversation that took place on Packernet after dark. You know, one of the big topics right now, and I think it's fascinating, I really do, because there's so many differing opinions um, there really can only be three or four opinions on this, but it seems like there's a, a couple that are dug in and and I can really appreciate the passion behind it. But, you know, we talk about this roster just being absolutely loaded. The elite talent. You kidding me? Like this is one of the best rosters in football. We keep saying it about this defense. And I'm what I keep asking myself is or, you know, asking just kind of out loud is when did we play like an elite defense? When did we play like a top five defense? Last year, we were middle-tier defense. We talked about this in the offseason, that so many people were just acting like we're going to bring the same guys back and magically jump to the top of the top of the heap, right? And I just never seen it that, that way. Jair, when he's at the top of his game, is as good a corner in the game, period. I completely agree. But, again, corner isn't that important of a, a position to me. You know, I talk about all the time, the top tier on defense is edge. we got a solid edge in – Rashawn Gary and on the opposite side of Preston Smith's not too bad, right? Not nowhere near Rashawn Gary's level. But that second tier, you need defensive tackle, middle linebacker, and free safety. Defensive tackles fairly short up, although I would say that Kenny Clark is keyed in more on pass rushing than covering the run, than playing the run, and it's really showing. Not that I've seen anything on film to go, wow, he's bad, but PFF grades it out as if he's a much better pass rusher than he is playing the run. That seems to be a problem because I think we're like fifth or sixth worst in the league in uh, in run defense grade. Um, middle linebacker, we're pretty well sure it up. We're going to talk about that here in a second. But free safety is the issue, guys. On defense, free safety is the number one issue. And I say free safety as if he's always playing center field, and that's not the case. You've seen it in the run fit on the Chalk Talk episode we did where he was kind of playing a little more of a strong safety. Forget where the tight end is. When I think of a strong safety, typically I think of the guy who's going to play in the box, right? And that might not be the right way of thinking, but I do know this, like on Spotrack and other websites, there's multiple websites that's got him listed as a strong safety, but they've got – Darn, or they've got Adrian Amos listed the same way. And the reason being is because this defense is so interchangeable with the late rotation they do with one safety coming into the box post-snap. Um, I don't want to bore you with all the details of that, but that that just kind of goes to show that these two safeties need to be versatile. Now, listen, Adrian Amos has struggled just as much. He's he's played really, really bad football this year. It's the last year of his contract. It sucks we got a couple voidable years on him on the backside, so he's going to be on the cap for a little bit of a hit next year. And that's the that's the price we paid to to go all in this year. We ran it back, guys. We ran it back, and in my opinion, the players are underperforming. Period. That's just the way I see it. I could be wrong, but that's kind of how I see it. Now let's talk about the fifth year option. When you said, um, Chris, you asked a great question. I'm so glad you brought it up, man. You said, um, do we just uh, stick with do we stick with them? Or uh, I guess you were insinuating, you know, you said cut your losses, tear off the Band-Aid. Here's the thing about the fifth-year option. It's 100% guaranteed. And I heard Ryan mention on his pod, like, hell, I don't know, maybe we could, you know, just cut him loose. It's it's pointless to cut him loose. The ideal scenario, if you don't want Savage on your roster, is to trade him and try to get the other team to eat some of that cost. That might be an option there, okay? But it is guaranteed. His fifth-year option – the contract is guaranteed. So it's pointless to just cut him. So let's hop into something that I want to point out here since we're on the savage subject. And thank you again for the uh, for the email there, Chris. Really, really appreciate your support, man, um, always. So <clears throat> when you talk about Darnell Savage, 
He's going to be on the roster next year unless somebody just jumps up and gives us a gift like the Chicago Bears did to the Pittsburgh Steelers, which let me hit, let me hit on that first before we move on. That's what I was saying. There's so many topics we could talk about. The trade deadline. Guys, there wasn't one of those receivers that we were in talks with trading for that were graded above a 70 PFF grade. Think about that. Overall offensive PFF grade. I think one was like 70.6. But that my, I can't remember who it was. I don't want to misquote. I think there was three or four receivers we were in the hunt on. If we had given up a second round pick for Chase Claypool, I would have been livid, absolutely livid. I was watching the chat, trying not to be rude, watching Twitter, trying not to be rude. But I'm going, what do you guys see in Chase Claypool? One guy came back and said, well, he the only reason his grades are so low is because he's played for crappy quarterbacks. He's on his fourth quarterback. I mean, how many quarterbacks does he need to have throwing him the ball before you go hark? PFF is saying just simply based off of his assignment and his opportunities, he sucks. So why would we do that? Essentially, what you're going to do is bring in Chase Claypool, and you're going to stunt the growth of Romeo Dobbs, Christian Watson, Samori Torre, some of these younger receivers that might might otherwise break out. Could you imagine if Donald Driver came on the scene as a seventh-round pick and you brung in somebody like that who was just going to be simply mediocre like a Chase Claypool and Donald Driver never got his reps and never got to mature into the all-time leading receiver for the Green Bay Packers? I mean, think about that. That's that's stuff that's that's Bill Parcells 101. Bill Parcells always talked about those are progress stoppers. When you bring in a player that's slightly better or on par with a younger player that's on your roster, and now with the CBA set up with the contracts of the rookies from previous draft year, where you get four year deal, and especially with a set with a seventh rounder, it's basically a minimum contract, right? And you stunt their growth, you're you're stopping progress for your roster. Because that guy that you just brought on, guess what's going to happen with Chase Claypool? When you bring him on, he's either going to be a short-term plug-and-play or you're going to sign him to a long-term contract. And I'm sorry, guys, have we looked at the wide receiver market lately? That's not going to be a cheap contract. It's not. Everything that we did to push our chips in to to open up this three-year window with Aaron Rodgers is all based around our wide receivers making minimal money. And what's crazy is all the people out there that – that act like the Packers are in cap hell and there's absolutely nothing we can do about it. And I loved hearing Ryan on his podcast say, I'm not doom and gloom like everyone else. I don't think it's the end of the world. I think we're going to figure it out with the cap. I 100% agree, completely agree. But how in the world were we going to pay Devontae Adams more money than the Las Vegas Raiders did and still stay afloat? Explain that to me. If all of a sudden Devontae uh, Adams is nowhere in the picture for the Packers and now we're still in cap hell. Use your head. It's the salary cap is only important on a schedule basis. I want you to understand what I'm saying. You can finagle the salary cap however you want to. You can push it out as long as you want to. Look at what they did with Pat Mahomes' contract, right? There's so many things you can do. But at the end of the day, there's going to be a deadline that applies. That's what happened with Zadarius Smith. We didn't know what was going on with Devontae Adams, what the end result was going to be. Aaron Rodgers' contract's trying to get done. Guess who the casualty was? Zadarius Smith. Now, there was locker room stuff, and that's been well documented. He seems to be doing just fine in, in Minnesota. I'm not going to go back on how I felt about that. I, you know, At the end of the day, it's like, all right, if he's going to be a locker room – uh, you know, bad guy, then get him out of here. We're better off without him. I, I really still see it that way for the long-term health of the organization. Don't know all the details. I was probably ignorant in even making that comment before if you don't know all the inside details. But in a timely manner, you look up and go, ah, you know what? Just let him walk. Get him out of here. Cut him loose. Free up the cap. Because there's just so many moving parts to that, right? But Darnell Savage, back to the fifth-year option to answer Chris's uh uh, question there. If nobody's willing to give us that gift that the Chicago Bears gave the, the Pittsburgh Steelers by shipping them out of town, and, and what I meant by that is they basically gave them a better pick than what they made, what they gave up for Chase Claypool. Because this this Chicago Bears draft pick, the reason they chose the Chicago Bears' offer over the Green Bay Packers is because they know the Bears are going to be picking much higher than the Packers. At least they felt like they were, right? And it looks like it's going to be the case. It's going to be a borderline first-round pick for Chase Claypool. The Pittsburgh Steelers drafted him 
And then they turned around and got a borderline first round pick back for him. And they don't even like him. So that's a story for another day, right? But Savage, if he indeed does has to stay on the roster because nobody's going to give you that gift, in my opinion, what I would like to see happen right now, in this window right now, how do you fix the Green Bay Packers? How do you make the, the Packers better today, this year, in this moment, this next four quarters that we're about to play against the Detroit Lions? You got to get Savage out of the lineup. I mean, Savage, guys, he is literally, there's only 29 players on our roster that play defense. He's graded out as the 27th worst. 46.4 is his grade. 46.4 with a 37.7 uh, tackle grade. And you wonder why the running game is struggling so bad. And I seen a clip on Twitter right before I went live here. This is Wednesday evening. This will go out Thursday around noon. Somebody posted a clip talking about, I don't like the way Joe Barry's run fits looking here. What are you talking about? I've showed you clip after clip after clip of Savage and other players literally missing their tackle, missing their assignment, and it's still Joe Barry's fault. It makes no sense to me. But if Savage is that bad, and you're you're probably going, well, who's better than him on the roster, Clayton? Who could we put in his place? I'm glad you asked. Guess who the top-graded player in the entire Green Bay Packers defensive room is? Rudy Ford, 81.1 PFF grade, 64 snaps. So, guys, this isn't like, oh, he's only played 15 snaps. We don't know if he's that good. 64 snaps is a pretty good sample size. I mean, when you put that into perspective, that's like, yeah, that, that's enough for me to go throw him out there. Let's see what he's got. And remember what I said about the safeties being somewhat interchangeable. If Amos is already playing free safety like we showed you on that run fit where Darnell Savage completely whiffed on the Seagaff tackle there for uh, – uh, for the Chalk Talk segment, you could see in the background, especially behind the, the camera behind the line there in the box, you could see Amos playing center field. He was playing free safety on that play. So it's interchangeable. Let's put Rudy Ford in here against the Detroit Lions. That's what I want to see. Put him in there and see if that grade stacks up. Guys, it may sink below, below Savages when put in that row. Who knows? But we don't know unless we try. And one thing's for sure, how many more games are we going to watch Darnell Savage completely screw the pooch? It happens every single week, play after play after play. This started last year. I was, If you guys remember when we go into the draft season last year when I first come on board with Packer Net Podcast, I was screaming, we need a safety, we need a safety, we need a safety. There's a lot of good safeties in this draft, right? And you know, we bash the heck out of the Chicago Bears for taking Brisker, but I'm sorry, he seems to be playing pretty good right now. I don't know his PFF grade, but that last game, he had a solid, solid game. It's like, why not give Rudy Ford a shot? Now, moving forward, again, you've got Savage on the roster next year. Rudy Ford's going to be a free agent. Here's what I would do. I've seen enough of Rudy Ford on special teams. If I was Brian Gutekunst, the first move I would make, and he would get criticized in the media and across the, the Goody haters all across, you know, Packers Twitter, and that's okay. I would go to Rudy Ford and go, hey, let's get you a two-year extension, big dog. You want some money in your pocket? Let's get you some guaranteed money. He's 26 years old, to the best of my knowledge. He's going to turn 27 later this year. What I would do is say, here's a three-year deal. Uh, sweeten up the pot with the guaranteed money. You're going to be our special teams ace, and we got we got a you know big things for you here in the future. You could do that and have a minimal style contract, especially if you float a check in front of a player uh, for guaranteed money that has not made much money. The best of my knowledge, I think you have fifty thousand dollars in guaranteed money. That's all. So think about that. Minimal salary. Guarantee some money. You minimize the cap hit. You lock him in for three years. You throw his butt into the starting rotation and see what he's got. Worst case scenario, he's not that great. You still got a great special teams player and a backup safety who's performed way above what you thought he would when you brought him in. That's the way I see that situation. And what could possibly happen? Rasul Douglas could possibly happen. Rudy Ford could come out and play lights out like Russell did last year. You put Savage's butt on the on the bench and make him play more special teams. You've now bolstered your safety position, which in my opinion is that second tier key spot on defense, and you're off to the races. What do you have to lose? Isn't it amazing how so many people are saying bench Aaron Rodgers? Like that's just normal, that's okay. But nobody's saying bench Darnell Savage. Like, well, he's a first-round pick. Who cares? I don't I don't care if he was. 
There's so many things I want to say right now, but I, you guys get so tired of my redneck one-liners. That's what I want to see happen, Rudy Ford. So I pulled up the PFF grades just to kind of give you guys an idea, too. Let me check the time. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from, including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Hey, U.S. Cellular customers, I've got good news, so don't hit skip forward just yet. I'm talking about their special customer event, Us Days. What's Us Days? It means exclusive offers just for their customers, just to say thanks, like up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. No, I didn't just misread that. That's up to $1,200 off. They must really like you. Us Days at U.S. Cellular, exclusive offers just for you, just to say thanks. Right now, U.S. Cellular customers get up to $1,200 to upgrade to any new phone. Terms apply. With threats to our nation waiting around every corner, adaptability is more important than ever. When conditions change without notice, quick strategic thinking is crucial. And with obstacles consistently impending, determination is essential in overcoming them. It's this willingness, decisiveness, and resilience that sets Marines apart. With our fighting spirit, we don't just fight battles. We win them. Marines are the constant our nation counts on to fight the unknown. And through adaptable problem solving, we do just that. Learn more at Marines.com. Introducing Royal Caribbean's newest ship, Icon of the Seas, the ultimate family vacation. The ultimate six slides, eight neighborhoods, zero compromise vacation. The ultimate never done that, can't wait to do it vacation. The ultimate chillin' by a different pool every day of the week vacation. This is the Icon of Vacations. Icon of the Seas. Arriving in 2024. Book today. Come seek the Royal Caribbean. Ships Registry Bahamas. All right. Let's kind of go through the PFF grades real quick. And I do. I like to do this after each week, the show where people are settling in. Because, guys, PFF is a great tool. I'm, I'm convinced now after watching. I've watched more film this year than I ever have. I've studied more football than I ever have this year. Not saying I'm great at it. I'm just telling you there's a much, 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 much larger saturation this year of game footage that I've seen than I ever have in the past. And repetition is the only thing that's going to make you better at anything. I'm, I'm watching the game, and every single week, what I see on that tape, I'm seeing it reflect on PFF. Now, Coach Hahn, I get the vibe he disagrees on run on the uh, on the offensive line play, and I'm going to respectfully, I'm I'm going to take everything that Coach Hahn says as gospel because he understands offensive line play, little nuances, technique, maybe what they are or are not trying to do in specific situations. I've already learned so much from him, just us teaming up on Chalk Talk and, and kind of breaking down film. But um, outside of that, everything that I've seen on film matches up with the PFF grade. So let's see, who are the top 10 offensive players for the Packers? Number one, Aaron Jones, 83.1. This is up to date today. Uh, Randall Cobb, number two, 79.9. Number three, David Bakhtiari, 79.2. Thank freaking goodness. You want to know why the offense played better last week against the Bills? David Bakhtiari came out and absolutely owned his assignment. And you guys know that's my second tier of importance on offense. Top tier quarterback, second tier left tackle, third tier is center and wide receiver. That's the way I see the offensive side of the ball in order of importance and all the other positions I didn't mention, I feel like are that fourth tier. Fiddle them in where you can, make it work, and let your coach and staff work their magic. But David Bottiari is slowly returning to the player he was, and that's great because of the cap hit that's involved with him and left tackle being so important. Number four, Look who it is, guys. Aaron Rodgers, 77.9. Aren't you glad we didn't cut him when he was grading out at 70? Aren't you glad we didn't throw him on the bench? 
and I am, I'm getting a little bit cocky with this because you see it week in and week out. I've posted clip after clip after clip on Twitter of him just throwing absolute dots, threading the freaking needle in situations that other quarterbacks would never be able to do because they can't throw off platform with accuracy the way Aaron Rodgers does. I'm not saying he's been perfect. It's obviously a down year. He's usually grading out in the 90s, but he's slowly creeping up there. I think he's seventh now in the entire National Football League in PFF grade. And he's going to crack 80. It's coming. I wouldn't be surprised if against Detroit, he grades out in the darn near 90s and then come back next week and he's already in the 80s and moving up the list. But Aaron Rodgers, number four, your fourth best player on your offense right now. Number five, A.J. Dillon, 70.4. Number six, Alan Lazard, 69.4. Number seven, Elton Jenkins, 69.0. Guys, when you get in the 60s, those are not good grades. They're not horrible, but you expect Elton Jenkins to play a lot better than that, right? 69.0. Number eight, Yash Nijman, 65.3. Number nine, Sammy Watkins, 65.1. Number 10, Zach Tom, 65.0. I'm proud of Zach Tom. That's that To me, that's a great rookie grade for an offensive lineman who was asked to play left tackle and then guard last week. I like what we're getting there. I think Zach Tom is going to be a long-term plug to this offensive line, and I'm really, really excited about it. If and when David Bakhtiari decides to walk walk away from the game, we're going to be in great shape, I think, with um, with Zach Tom. What I want to see happen is try to get something long-term with Yash Nijman because just like what we said with Rudy Ford, it'd be a, a good, cheap contract. Let's move on to the defensive side of the ball. Already mentioned, guys, the highest-graded player on the Green Bay Packers roster, Rudy Ford, safety, 81.1. Get him in the freaking lineup. Let, let him go out there and see what he can do. It can't get no worse than Darnell Savage. If he comes, if if we started Rudy Ford this week and we came back next week and uh, and he graded out lower than Darnell Savage's forty six point four, then I was I would be the first one to tell you I'm a moron and don't ever listen to my podcast again. But I have a hard time believing he would finish that far down the list. I really do. Number two, Rashawn Gary, love to see it. We picked up his fifth year option. It was a great option to pick up, unlike Savage's seventy nine point seven. Devondre Campbell at number three, love it, love it, love it. He's slowly climbing up the charts again, 76.7. Number four, Jair Alexander had a great bounce back game there against the Bills, albeit he was covering their number two receiver for the most part of the night, 76.1. Great job. This one hurts. Not really. It's only seven snaps. You can't really count it. Kobe Jones, I'm pretty sure he just got let go. But again, seven snaps is seven snaps. Now, this is a a good parallel. If Rudy Ford only had seven snaps, you wouldn't be hearing me say what I just said about Rudy Ford. I mean, I would still be dogging Savage, don't get me wrong, but I wouldn't be sitting here saying, you know, start Ford over Savage, blah, 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 um, because, you know, seven snaps are seven snaps. But 64 snaps for Rudy Ford, man, come on. Let's see what he's got. Number six, Kenny Clark at a 70.6. Guys, that's not a good grade for Kenny. And again, Kenny, though, here's the thing. Pass rush, 83.2. Run defense, 55.5. You want to know why the run defense is so bad? Kenny Clark is not playing gap sound. Kenny Clark is not playing the run well. He's not. Now, he's a great pass rusher, and, and this goes back to what we talked about maybe with those those front, you know, four, front seven players in the box. Defensive coordinators like Greg Cosell are said, you know, maybe they're being more along the lines of, you know what, we're willing to give up the run. Just make sure you you stay on your pass game keys and and cover your assignments and, and don't give up the big play in the passing game. That could be the case. Number seven, Devontae Wyatt, 70.5. That is a great rookie grade. Um, not a small sample size, 57 snaps. It's a pretty good little chunk. I want to see more of Devontae Wyatt. Right behind him is Jaron Reed. Uh, Jaron Reed's had a, a decent year, 65.8, especially for the amount of money he's making. Preston Smith, 65.3. We got to get that grade up, guys. He's great in run defense, but his tackle grade's been a 37, and his pass rush grade's only a 59.5. You do see him playing a lot of contain, kind of playing the run look and letting Rashawn eat off the edge with uh, with Kenny Clark. I kind of feel like there's something there. I, I almost feel like they're, they're not putting as much emphasis on getting to the quarterback with Preston Smith, and they're doing it with Kenny Clark on the same side as Rashawn Gary most of the time. That's kind of the vibe I get. And check this out at number 11, Eric Wilson, the linebacker that filled in for Quay, 64.3. Um, only had 24 snaps after Quay got ejected. I'm not saying Quay is a bad player, but Quay is playing bad right now, 51.3. Might want to pull him out of the lineup a little bit more. This is where you got to have the Weibo, says the uh, defensive coordinator, to go, you know what, let's go with the better player right now. 
I, I'm, I'm not expecting Quay Walker to be a superstar every game he ever plays, and we got plenty of time to bring him along. But right now, we need to win some freaking ball games if we're going to salvage this season. Those are some of the things that I'd be looking for on the defensive side of the ball. And again, get Rudy Ford in the freaking lineup, right? All right, so we're going to change pace here. We got about 14 minutes left in the pod, and we're going to talk about some good stuff here. Been a lot of Aaron Rodgers talk, right? We're going to kind of wrap the pot up with some Aaron Rodgers talk. There are some people that claim that Aaron Rodgers is absolutely horrible. You need to bench him. There's other people saying you need to trade him. They have no clue what the contract looks like, but they're saying trade him, and that's okay. Um, and it's kind of hard to get a read because people are so passionate about their opinion, right? You, you, you know, you hear me talk about Aaron Rodgers, and I'm like, he's had this is my stance. I'm gonna get my official stance on Aaron Rodgers because people try to make me out to be this guy that just absolutely hunky go dory loves everything he does, and then other people, you know, try to make it sound like a, you know, at times I want to completely cut him. Aaron Rodgers is having a down year, but understand, even as a down year, do you understand what his grade is? Like. At a 77.9, guys, he is number seven in the National Football League. He is a borderline top five quarterback right now. And there's people saying they want to bench him. There's people saying they don't want him back next year. And he's playing with one of the lowest graded wide receiver rooms in the entire uh, National Football League. He's playing with one of the lowest graded offensive line in the entire National Football League. And he's still grading at a 77.9. Right. I just want to point that out. But I put a Twitter poll out because I'm like, man, this is kind of fog of war. It's hard to understand, you know, who stands where. And and honestly, I started feeling like, man, maybe I'm maybe I'm missing something here. Maybe I'm wrong. Let's see what the whole, you know, everybody that I'm, you know, hooked up with on Twitter. Let's see what they think about Aaron Rodgers. So we did that. The tweet I sent out was, all right, Packer fans, let's hear from you. Do you prefer Aaron Rodgers to retire after this season or have him back for one more season before hanging it up? You know, the big talk is, is he going to retire after this year or next year? That To me, I don't feel like he's coming back a third year. I could be wrong. Kind of hope I am, especially if he's still playing at a high level by then. But that's kind of how I see it. Well, the poll results, we got 720 votes, which is absolutely freaking awesome. That's a bunch of people voting. 67.1% said they want him to return for 2023, and only 32.9% said they want him to go away. So, to me, it's pretty, uh, I don't know, it's pretty evident that Packers Nation are still on the Aaron Rodgers train, and I'm here for it. I love it. Again, 67% want him to stay, right? So, one of the conversations that took place on Twitter yesterday, and this one I wanted to kind of get into before we wrap the show up, is we had a guy that for whatever reason tagged me in a tweet and he had brung up Aaron Rodgers' contract. And the convers- you know how it is, man. You're having a conversation with, with a couple people and then all of a sudden somebody that doesn't follow you, you don't follow them, they jump into the conversation and they start getting rude. And, and not that he was necessarily getting rude, but just kind of aggressive here and there. And basically said, one guy said, we can't trade him because of his contract clause. It's not it's it's there's no no trade clause. It's if you trade him, the penalty is going to be ma- I mean, absolutely massive. If you guys remember when the contract was finished, it's exactly what Ian Rappaport said was that this was a three year commitment to Aaron Rodgers. If they tried to trade him within the next three years or just dump him, just cut him outright, then they, they it, they're literally committing cap suicide, right? Now I don't mean to use that word lightly. Please don't take it that way. I've got friends and family that have have passed away with suicide. I don't take it lightly. I'm just, I shouldn't have even used that word. I apologize. It kind of hit home for me there. So I know I'm in the wrong there, (laughs) but um, it would, it would put them in a, in a situation where it's just impossible for them to even function as a team because the cap hit would be so hard. Right. So that got brought up and I'm like, that guy gets it. Okay. He understands there's no way they can trade him. They're not trading Aaron Rodgers. Stop talking about it. It's like Nick Saban. I'm not going to do it. So quit asking, but one of the other things a guy said, well, what happens if he retires? And one of the guys jumped into the chat and said, it'll be even worse if he retires. And I went, what? What? And they started name dropping a, a specific Twitter follow that 
he seems to be, in my opinion, it's 110% doom and gloom. Everything is posted is just doom and gloom, doom and gloom, doom. When Aaron Rodgers signed the contract, this is, I told y'all from the beginning, this is a bad idea. It's going to ruin the Packers cap, blah, blah, blah. All the same things that a number of people said about the New Orleans Saints, but somehow they still fill the team every year. It was literally three years after they went all in and did the cash over cap stuff that everybody's talking about today, that everybody's using today, that the Rams used to win the Super Bowl last year, all those things, right? And and all of a sudden it was like, oh yeah, we're we're hemmed up. And when he said that, I'm like, all I said was I tweeted at him and said, that's not true. Because it's not. Guys, first of all, what I'm about to read to you guys, this isn't all that goes into it. I listened to a podcast with Andrew Brandt, and he had on Mark Rogers. Mark Rogers is a super agent. He's mainly a baseball agent, but he works with Russell William uh, Russell Wilson, and he actually uh, organized and uh, negotiated Russell Wilson's contract with the Denver Broncos. To the best of my knowledge, the second highest paying contract, most expensive contract in the history of the National Football League, this guy managed it. And in this conversation, Aaron Rodgers' contract got brought up. You want to know what Andrew Brandt, who is a former – front office executive for the Green Bay Packers for a couple decades. This was his opinion. And Mark Rogers, the guy who's responsible for negotiating the second highest paid contract in NFL history, their opinion was no one knows the stipulations in the contract. No one knows the options clauses. Nobody knows exactly what that is. And this is what they said. I personally think it's a one-year deal with four dummy years on it. Now, let that sink in. Let's rewind. What did Aaron Rodgers say on the Pat McAfee show when he was talking about his contract? It's a one plus a two with the option of a three. Does that sound familiar? A one meaning I can, I'm can. i going to play this year. I have the option to play a second year, or I have a second year on it, and then the option of a third. To me, it sounds like, they committed to him for three years, but the ball's in his court if he wants to walk away. Guys, that doesn't mean that all the guaranteed money that was thrown in that contract extension, if he just decides to retire, he gets all that money. Guys, don't – it doesn't work like that. And I know most of the people I'm talking to, you understand that. But, again, the point I was making on Twitter is you don't know all the details to it. If, if Andrew Brandt – and Mark Rogers doesn't know. How in the world do you know? You've got 127 followers on Twitter. Like I don't, I don't, I don't. I'm be the first to tell you I don't have a freaking clue exactly what's in the contract, right? But we do know roughly what will happen when he retires. Okay, so let's lay that out real quick, just to clear the air. Is and this came from uh, OverTheCap.com. Okay, it says what happens in Aaron Rodgers reti- if Aaron Rodgers retires. If Rodgers were to walk away, he would forfeit, hear that word, forfeit all his rights to the $59.4 million in guaranteed salary for next year. In order to best accommodate the hit on the salary cap, my assumption would be that the Packers and Rodgers would sign a new contract. Huh, does that sound familiar? Doesn't that sound creative, just like what Ian Rappaport reported? Now, all anybody heard was three-year extension worth $150 million. Why is that? Because that averages out to $50 million per year, and that's the number everybody very, 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 very ignorantly throws around, right? It'd be different if you just throw it around and go, I thought that's what it was, but it's another thing when you try to act like, oh, this is, trust me, I know what I'm talking about. Like, come on. Again, Andrew Brandt and Mark Rogers doesn't know. How do you know? Are you are you in Aaron's inner circle? Anyway. The $50 million, the whole point there, was to raise the quarterback market. That was Aaron doing a favor for the rest of the quarterbacks in the league to go, look, here's going to be the stamp, $50 million. How do I know that? Because Mark Murphy didn't leak that information out, guys. Like, Mark Murphy and Brian Gutekunst didn't go to the press and go, hey, guys, tell everybody it's $50 million per year. Why would you do that? They have no benefit whatsoever in their locker room. Every player in that locker room would be running them go, oh, let me get a cut of that. Let me get a cut of that. So who released it? The agency released it. Why did the agency release it? Because the number that the media is going to talk about, a.k.a. Ian Rappaport, who, by the way, works for the NFL and wants to inflate the numbers, right? Do you think the NFL owners want to feel like, want the public to think that they're paying more rather than less? Of course they do. 
because it makes them out to be the nice owner. It makes them out to be the good guy. Look how much we're paying these players. Of course, we take care of them. What do you mean CTE? All those things. So again, it was just a stamp. It was a a salary cap stamp, an easy number for everyone in the organ or everyone in the business to go. All right, fifty million is the new ceiling, right? And then guess what happened with Deshaun Watson? He got slightly under that per year, but what did Deshaun Watson get? Two hundred and forty some million in guarantee, guys. The Browns are on the hook for that. There is nothing they can do about that. Nothing. Aaron Rodgers' contract is totally, totally different. So this is what they said, back to where I was at. My assumption would be that the Packers and Rodgers would sign a new contract where the option bonus was eliminated. <gasps> but but the guy on Twitter, the hero that runs around gloom and doom, talking about he's a salary cap expert, he was the one saying there's no way to avoid it. Huh. The option bonus, option, option, you hear there? There's options in this contract that nobody knows about. This is just one. We don't know the entire details of the contract. The option bonus eliminated and just a $1.165 million salary remained. That would reduce Rodgers' salary cap charge to $16.9 million, and they would carry him on the roster as a procedural move until June 2nd. At that point, they would put him on the retired list and the salary cap charge in that case would be $15.8 million in 2023 and then $24.4 million in 2024. Where's the $50 million? Can somebody please find me the $50 million? Because once again, the $50 million cap hit, in quotations, has disappeared again. And this is why I said this. All I said to the guy on Twitter, are you 100% sure that you're accurate? Crickets. I almost tweeted back, are you still there? Well, no, that's what so-and-so said. Okay, you keep tagging him, but he won't comment, so I'm talking to you. You're the one who called me out. Are you 100% sure? No, well, you just said that I was wrong. I, I didn't ask you that. Are you 100% sure on your answer? And he wouldn't answer it because he's not. And he, and, he, and he won't even respond to the question because he realized I just stepped in it. And I don't mean to be an a-hole. But, man, if someone's going to try that hard to prove their ignorance, I'm going to be the first one in the line to tap them on the shoulder and go, you're right, you're ignorant. And, again, I went right back to the same answer for me. I don't know. I'm not pretending to know. But you guys got to stop with this gloom and doom. Like, the Packers are going to have to fold up and, and leave Green Bay because Aaron Rodgers signed a contract. It's not the case. So think of the money that would free up, right? So now the, the next argument always goes to this, and this is what drives me crazy that Aaron Rodgers breaking the bank, and the reason the Packers don't have any money is Aaron Rodgers, blah, 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 blah. Once again, let's go to the cap hits. But better yet, better, rather than going to the cap hit this year, I want to go back a couple years. I want to explain exactly where Aaron Rodgers felt, found, where he fell on the Green Bay Packers cap hit list in conjunction with the rest of the National Football League. We did this in the offseason. And it finally, we get down to football and everybody stops talking about, thank God. And then people, as soon as Aaron Rodgers throws one incomplete pass, now all of a sudden it's, well, we just need to cut him. All right, what's contract look like? And he gets brought back up. Let's go back to 2020. 2020, Aaron Rodgers won the MVP. His cap hit was $21.6 million. Cash over cap, guys. Cash is the money paid up front, in hand, guaranteed. Cap is how it's allocated. It's it's where it's 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 accounting. It's where are you putting the money? Where's it going on the books? Right? So this was before his new contract, $21.6 million. Guys, he was the 10th highest paid player his MVP season in 2020. Ahead of him, Ryan Tannehill, Drew Brees, Ben Roethlisberger, Tom Brady, Philip Freaking Rivers, Jimmy Freaking Garoppolo, Jared Goff. Russell Wilson, and Dak Prescott. Aaron was the 10th highest cap hit. All right, let's, that's just one year, Clayton. Let's move on to 2021, shall we? Aaron Rodgers' cap hit, I'm pretty sure, was seventh in the entire National Football League. In 2021, I'm sorry, in 2021. And the reason I mention that is because it was another MVP season. Another MVP season. I'm going to try to copy and paste this, get it pulled back up. One, 
Here we go. It's loading now. So in 2021, he was on the books for $27.0 million in 2021, won another MVP. He was actually third highest in 2021. So I was wrong on the seven. Third highest. $27.0 million. Where's the $50 million cap hit? Can somebody help me? Because I'm not, I'm not seeing it. All right. Players ahead of him. Guess who made more money than him? By the tune of $4 million. Kirk Cousins. Russell Wilson made $5 million more million than Aaron Rodgers against the cap in 2021. So now let's move on to 2022. Okay. 2022. Aaron Rodgers, $28.5 million against the cap this year. Ahead of him in Detroit, Jared Goff, 31.1. Ahead of Kirk, uh, or ahead of him, Kirk Cousins, 31.4. Patrick Mahomes, 35.7. Ryan Tannehill, 38.6 million dollar cap hit this year in Tennessee. Aaron Rodgers is the fifth highest paid quarterback this year in the NFL. All right, let's move on to 2023. In 2023, Aaron Rodgers is $31.6 million against the cap. That's 10th highest in the entire NFL. Ahead of him, Derek Carr, Tom Brady, Matt Ryan, who just got benched in Indy, Kurt Cousins in Minnesota, Ryan Tannehill in Tennessee, Josh Allen in Buffalo, Patrick Mahomes in KC, Dak Prescott in Dallas, and then Deshaun Watson in Cleveland. Deshaun Watson, $54.9 million. And again, Aaron Rodgers, 31.6. So, and here's the thing too, guys. The quarterback market's going to continue to set. If we were to, you know, move on from Aaron Rodgers, you understand we got to pay a quarterback, right, unless we draft one. So, it's not it's not something that's just going to fall into our lap. Now, why did I move all that, you know, why did I move all that around? And, and we may even try to, try to get the load here again for 2024. Why did I mention all that? Because everybody's talking as if Aaron Rodgers is breaking the freaking bank, and he isn't. It's not the case at all. Again, the number that everybody heard was $50 million per year. He's not making $50 million uh, against the cap. He's not going to. Here we are in 2024. Let's say he comes back in 2024. His cap hit $40.7 million ahead of him. Josh Allen, Derek Carr, Patrick Mahomes, Matthew Stafford, Kyler Murray, Dak Prescott, Deshaun Watson. Like, I don't, I don't know what else to say about it. So, when you look at it in that perspective, Aaron Rodgers is nowhere near the highest paid quarterback according to cap hit in the in the National Football League, and he's grading out as the seventh best quarterback. Explain to me again why we want him to leave. Are, do, who are you replacing Aaron Rodgers with? That's what I want to know. And and it, let's say you do replace him with someone who's going to play just as good, right, or better. Let's say it's Lamar Jackson. Let's say Lamar Jackson. Let's say that Lamar Jackson did get to test free agency and somehow or another we were able to bend the cap to be able to sign him in free agency, which it's not going to happen because he's going for Deshaun Watson guaranteed money. Let's say Aaron Rodgers is long gone and we go sign Lamar Jackson. Lamar Jackson's grading out as a 76.8 this year, guys. Passing grade, 65.8. He's 11th best in the National Football League, according to quarterbacks. But yeah, Aaron Rodgers, we just need to throw him to the side and go find another quarterback. Guys, you're not going to find another quarterback like that. Like, it's going to take you drafting the right guy. It's going to take you hitting the freaking lottery like you did with Aaron Rodgers. And a lot of people don't like to mention this, but Aaron Rodgers, the reason Aaron Rodgers turned out to be Aaron Rodgers is because he got to sit on the bench for several years, not get beat up and banged up, and be able to learn the offense and actually mature into a good football player. That's how that came about period. So I just wanted to cover that real quick because there's a lot of that talk going on, right? And I wanted to kind of look at the contract again, if Spotrack will, will continue to work here for me. Um, let's look at the team as a whole, right? For 2022, let's move on to 2023 and kind of just a quick glance in advance of what 2023 is going to look like if indeed the site will work, and it did. Okay, cool. So Aaron Rodgers at the top of the heap, $31.6 million against the cap next year. This is barring any restructures, guys. Like, the, you understand contracts are going to get restructured, but this is how it sits right now. David Bakhtiari, $29.0 million. That's going to get restructured, in my opinion. You want to know how we're going to get $30 million off the books next year before, week, or before preseason week one or before the deadline, whenever it is? 
David Bakhtiari's one. Kenny Clark, 20, uh, $23.9 million against the cap next year. Kenny Clark's underperforming big time, in my opinion. And, you know, he's he's going to be on the roster in 2023, hands down. I hope he amps it up. Again, his pass rush grades get great, but we got to get that, that uh, run defense grade up. Aaron Jones is another one. $20.0 million. He's only got 9.5 in dead cap. They could free up quite a bit of money. They could free up $10 million in cap with Aaron Jones. I'm not saying they should cut him. By the way, the doom and gloomer did. The doom and gloomer said cut him but or trade him. They were talking about we should trade Aaron. Chalk up the season, trade Aaron Jones at the deadline. When I heard that, I wanted to pull my hair out. I'm like, so we don't want Aaron Jones, arguably the best running back in the entire National Football League. We don't want him on the roster moving forward? Because he's proven that he's willing to take a pay cut and stay. He's proven to be able to renegotiate. He absolutely loves Green Bay. Why would we not keep him? It's I swear I think some of these takes are just people trying to trying to stir stuff up. I think some of them aren't Packer fans, to be honest with you. I really do. But that's kind of how I see the roster. Hopefully, um, I can get this edited well enough. We hit a little snag there with Spotrack's website, but we we ended up covering the numbers. I think we made all the points we wanted to. Again, wanted to answer those emails, and as I began answering those emails, man, it really started to spark spark all kinds of thoughts. Like, oh man, well, you know, you know, what about this? What about that? What can we do with Savage? Well, we can't cut Savage because the fifth year option is guaranteed. But you know, how can we make everything work? Um, Savage is going to be on the roster next year, guys. It's going to happen. I just hope personally, that Joe Barry steps back and goes, you know what? This isn't working. Let's give someone else a chance. Let's give someone else a chance to shine. I really hope they go that route. So I'm not ready to write this season off yet. You're seeing the team improve. Last week was a step in the right direction. Let's let's come out and try to play our best ball, man. I'm I'm of the opinion of John Madden. I don't believe in tanking. You know, when the when the New York Giants, I believe it was the New York Giants. I can't remember exactly which coach it was. It might not have been the Giants. There was a team one year, maybe it was Detroit, that they were saying that they should just tank, whatever it was. And John Madden, they end up going out and winning a game that costed them a draft spot. And John Madden gave the head coach a call that next day and said, I cannot tell you how thankful I am for you to go out there and win that game. Because the second that it, it – that, Every single snap in the National Football League isn't about winning, isn't about beating your opponent and making the game better every single snap, then we don't have a game anymore. And and I remember the coach almost tearing up like, man, that came from Coach Madden. That meant a lot to him, right? So I don't understand these people. They're going, oh, let's just scrap up the year and we'll try to reset next year. Excuse my language, but the hell with that. Let's go down swinging. Let's go out here and put the best players on the field Let's adjust as we go. One thing I'm proud of is Aaron Rodgers' attitude. Aaron Rodgers is like, no, man, we we it, like the way that he's got slandered in the media and the way that people turn on him so quick. And I'm finding out today I got to re- be really cautious because it's a very, very, very minor amount, a minute amount of Packer fans that feel that way, according to the poll of over 800 people now. Um, but it would be real easy for him to go, you know what? I shouldn't have came back. Let love start. I'll, I'll go to backup, collect my check, and I'll get out of y'all's way next year. You don't want me here? Fine. Like, it'd be easy for someone to do that. I'm not saying I would do that. And we know Aaron's not going to do that. But I love Aaron. We're just – if we can just win one, that's what he's saying. If we can just win one and get out of this slump, it can change the whole trajectory of the season. And he sounds like a guy who's coming back next year, in my opinion. But um, I think Ryan kind of disagrees from the vibe I get from him. And, and you know – I respect that. It could be the case. I could be completely looking into it wrong, right? Um, But I just love the fact that he's willing to fight. But that's the way I see it. Let's go out here and try to win these ball games, man. Let's go out here. Let's turn this season around. Why not? Why not us? And here's the other thing. If you don't make the playoffs, at least make sure every single opponent you've got left on the roster knows they've been in a freaking fight. That's what I want to see. And that's what Buffalo seen last week. I loved it. You know, one guy said, oh, that's because Buffalo was playing with their food. Playing with their food? You didn't watch the same game I watched because we were pounding the freaking rock down their throat in the second half. And I seen the I seen Jair Alexander picking passes off. I seen Rasul Douglas picking passes off. I seen people fighting. And that, that gave me a lot of hope, a lot of hope in this Packers roster. So, again, <laughs> I want to say this as we get ready to wrap up. We were without our top three receivers, 
and our top two inside linebackers and our second best offensive linemen. And we only lost by 10 points to the Bills. That stuff has to be taken into account, guys. It has to be. So I'm I'm on the uh, I'm on the Packer train, ride or die, baby. If this ship's going down, I'm gonna be at the bottom of the ocean with you. Because I, I love this team. I love everything they represent. I love the leadership that's in place. I believe in Matt LaFleur. I believe in Joe Barry. I, you know, Stinovich, it's hard for me to say I believe in Stinovich. I don't think he's a true offensive coordinator, but I like the fact that the guy's a hard worker and what he's trying to do with this offensive line and, and trying to help buck us along and all that. That's another thing, too, guys. God, there's so many points. That's what I was saying. I knew we wouldn't have time to cover everything, but think of everything that was lost from this coaching staff. We lost our offensive coordinator, our we lost our quarterback's coach. Heck, we we had a um, you know our uh, outside linebackers coach Mike Smith jump ship and go over there with Pet in Minnesota, right? Like this coaching staff isn't the same coaching staff, and there's going to be adjustments. You're seeing it all across the league. It's why the LA Rams are struggling so bad. They lose Kevin O'Connell. Kevin O'Connell takes off into Minnesota, has immediate success. The Rams are struggling. They're trying to get people into place to build that chemistry back up. Man, it doesn't happen overnight, but. Again, I'm proud of this team. I'm proud of the fans, man. That poll, that poll on Twitter really, really gave me hope in the fan base again because I was starting to get a little bit discouraged. Like, man, am I the only person that feels like Aaron Rodgers isn't the one to blame here? And it's, well, he's making enough money. Okay, I just showed you the money. Sorry, he's not making $50 million per year on a cap. Ain't happening, buddy. I don't care how much money he puts in his pocket. I care about what goes into the cap. And typically the people that care about how much money goes into his pocket Probably a little bit of jealousy there, just being honest. That or they don't like ayahuasca. But with that being said, we're going to get out of here. Thank you guys so much for your time. What a heck of a way to end it with ayahuasca. That's something else right there. As always, let's go out and be the change we want to see in the world. Go Pack Go. They just took a-